This video is brought to you by CKGSB, China's only not-for-profit independent business school. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great uh, honor to be here. I want to thank the uh, school for inviting me uh, and for making me uh, so welcome. I feel uh, humbled to uh, uh, sit in front of such a, a uh, uh, distinguished uh, group of people um, whose uh, aggregate success, the success of all of you put together, I think outshines anything that I've achieved. So, uh, uh, as I say, I, I stand here a little bit humbled and I will do my best to say a few things that perhaps you'll find a little bit interesting at least. So, I'm going to talk to you about um, some ways in which we see the media world changing. I don't have uh, too many Chinese examples, so I look forward very much to hearing from you whether or not you feel what I'm talking about reflects at all uh, what you know about the Chinese media market, which is not my area of expertise. So, um, our, this particular story starts um, a few years ago, probably now uh, nearly 10 years ago, and I was running um, economist.com. Uh, the website of The Economist, and uh, I made a mistake because I was work trying to think about what to do with Economist.com, and The Economist as a magazine was very successful. I was trying to work out what to do with the website, and um, I thought that if I did on the website what the magazine did, then that would be fine. But I realized that actually what the website uh, was and what a website was was something that was fundamentally different from a, uh, from a magazine. And that a website was what we call a lean forward experience. That actually, whereas in a magazine you come, you um, sit down with it, you lean back, you immerse yourself in the content. When it comes to a website, you want more than that. You want something different to that. You lean forward, you interact, you share, and you participate. So we realized that in a magazine world, you were in this lean back, immersive world. And in a, mag in a, in a website, you were leaning forward, participating, sharing um, in an interactive experience. And then as soon as we saw the, first of all, the Kindle in 2008, and then the iPad and other tablets uh, a couple of years later, we realized that actually it was a new age of lean back. And that if you think about, I don't know, can't speak to exactly how it was marketed here, but if you think about the adverts that were all around the world for the um, iPad, the pictures that were shown on big billboards, posters that you saw outside, were of people literally leaning back. It didn't talk about the specifications of an iPad. It didn't say, this is how powerful an iPad is. It didn't talk about the functionality. It didn't say what you could do on an iPad. It just showed a picture of somebody leaning back with an iPad in their lap, and they were reading or watching a film or something like that. And what we found that whereas on a website people might stay for a few minutes, what we found was that when people were reading on these new devices, they were reading not just for as long as they read a magazine, but even longer. And you can see from this chart that we find people read The Economist on an iPad for hours, not for minutes. And what's more, um, they read in depth. There have been studies done to see how much on a website people read People don't read on a website, they skim. If there are more than about uh, 200 words on a website, which is just a small paragraph, then people read less than 50%, and by the time you get to three or 400 words on a page, on a website, people are reading less than 10%. In a magazine or on a tablet, people are leaning back and they are reading the whole article. And what's more, they're reading and not sharing, even though, of course, on an iPad you can email an article, you can share an article through Facebook or Twitter. People actually don't do that. What we find is, regardless of age, it's not just because older people don't do that, young people as well, when they're in this reading lean-back mode, are not in this sharing participatory mode. And what that means is that surprising titles become winners in this new world. These are two... Uh, well-known titles in the West by, uh, from a company called Condé Nast. They're not uh, our magazines. 
Wired is a famous magazine about uh, um, technology. You would think it would do really well in these new digital media, but in fact it's the New Yorker, a much more traditional reading magazine, that has actually done a lot better on the iPad, for instance, than Wired has. And I'm sure, how many people here know, have heard of the Huffington Post? So the Huffington Post is a, is a famous uh, um, user-generated content and contributor-generated content. Only exists in the digital world, founded by Ariana Huffington. Ariana um, launched a, a, uh, a new online magazine called Huffington. And what she said was that she was launching it in this new iPad world because she believed that it was all about reading. And she said that, you know, we continue to redefine the tablet experience. I think it's fair to say that we will soon be living in a golden age of reading. So she absolutely saw that the iPad, even though she was, if you like, the high priestess of the web world, Ariana recognized that the iPad offered something uh, different. Now, back in uh, 2010, we asked our readers, who were mainly reading in print in those days, how do you expect to be reading in two years' time? And they um, said that they expected in two years' time to be reading in digital. So they expected back in 2010, that by now they'd be reading digitally. In fact, it hasn't quite worked out the way we expected. Not so much because people aren't reading digitally, because they are, but people expected back in 2010, and we expected them, to be stopping reading print and to be starting to read digitally. And what we've actually found is that that isn't what's happened, that it's actually turned into a multi-platform world. And that actually what you can see is that there is a group of people who only read digitally and there is a group of people who only read um, in print. But actually the significant majority of people actually read across multiple channels. So you have this um, new kind of reading that in a sense is an old kind of reading, this lean back reading that now exists in a digital world. So the question then is if that phenomenon exists, how big and what is the how big is the audience for it, and what is that audience like? And we recognised again a few years ago that there was a extraordinary uh, trend, an extraordinary movement growing throughout the world, where people wanted to be challenged by the media that they read. In many parts of the world, there is a feeling that. In order to succeed in media, you have to do what we call dumbing down. You have to, you have to make it very simple, and hey, you, you have to make it uh, very straightforward. You have to make it about celebrity, and you have to make it about gossip, and you have to make it about trivial matters, and that people don't want to be challenged by the media that they read. We believe people do want to be challenged. And we believe it comes from the fact that people recognize that they want to be more intelligent. So you can think about it with an, as an, with an analogy, an example of luxury. So if you go back 20 years, the luxury market was relatively straightforward in most parts of the world. There were um, uh, luxury goods that the very rich bought, and then there was the mass market that everyone else bought. And this is not a very exciting example of luggage, but uh, it's the uh, example that I think makes the point. What actually has happened over time is that a whole series of products and brands have grown up that go right across the um, spectrum of price and uh, quality and eliteness. So um, that means that there are some people who buy very cheap and there are some who pay, spend huge amounts of money on very expensive luggage. But then there are lots of people who will buy Louis Vuitton. There are lots of people who will buy Toomey. There are lots of people who will buy brands which I'm sure many of you know. And that phenomenon is called mass affluence, that people choose to consume um, uh, in certain areas of their lives, they choose to spend money on certain kinds of um, clothing or travel or wine or other or art. People pick certain things that they are going to um, uh, spend their money on. And the same thing we believe is true in media. It's very easy to see media in these traditional terms of elite media, media that uh, just a few people at the top of society, at the intellectual heights of society, um, consume, and then everyone else is consuming mass media. 
But actually, we believe that's wrong. That actually, yes, there are some elite media, and there is definitely mass media, but in the middle, there is a huge market for what we call mass intelligence. And it is actually, in many parts of the world, and I look forward to having your feedback about whether this is true in uh, China, in many parts of the world, it is a mass phenomenon that the, some of the most successful films today um, in, in uh, many parts of the world are films that are extremely intellectually uh, challenging, that many of the world's radio stations that are most successful are now the most um, are actually challenging, that, that classical music channels are becoming some of the most commercially successful as well as some of the most popular um, in the world. You see this with opera. You know, I don't know um, the extent to which uh, Chinese opera is a mass phenomenon, but historically, uh, Western opera is seen as has been seen as the the um, uh, areas where only the most educated, only the most wealthy, only the most socially elite would take advantage of. And what's happening today is, in all sorts of ways, that. Opera, Western opera, is now becoming something that people throughout the social spectrum are beginning to take part in and consume. I say you see it with independent films. This was a big film in the West called The King's Speech. I don't know whether that made it uh, into uh, China. But it was a very uh, uh, small film about uh, a speech impediment by a former king of, uh, of uh, uh, the United Kingdom. And as you see, at the box office it made nearly 450 million US dollars. And what's interesting is that people have different ways, in, just as they do with um, uh, luxury, so people mix and match. So whereas it's no longer the case that people say, I'm only going to dress in Prada, they will dress in, 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 in clothes from the supermarket and clothes from Prada, so it's the case that people do that with their media as well. Now, it used to be the case I don't know, that, that people would say, I no longer use mass media, I'm only going to read The Economist, I'm only going to um, watch sophisticated drama, I'm only going to go to the theatre, I'm not going to watch uh, television anymore. But actually what's happening in media is that people are consuming across the whole range of media, from the popular to the more intellectually stimulating. And the reason for that, we believe, is because of a deep human need that's represented by the Polish psychologist um, Abraham Maslow. And he talked about a hierarchy of needs. And I don't know whether you've come across that at all in your uh, uh, studies, but it's a very interesting way to see the development of societies. And he talks about how as societies develop, they start by worrying about what he calls their physiological needs, whether they can get food and drink. Then they worry about safety. They worry to make sure they have security. But then they worry about things like esteem, how, whether or not people think they are uh, uh, wealthy people, that people should think they are important. And that's perhaps what's driving some of that consumption of luxury. But then they get to worry about cognitive needs. They get to worry about how they think, about their intelligence, about their education. And they get to a stage of self-actualization, which is they become the person they want to be. And the person they want to be involves the way in which they think and the way in which their mind works. And that leads to this thought that says, actually, what it is to be cool today is to be smart. So what does that mean for publishing? Well, publishing traditionally was a very straightforward business. You made money in, in a combination of two ways, traditionally. You, you, um, uh, ran, you built an audience for a product, and if you could, you sold that product, your magazine, say, or your newspaper, to your audience. And then you ran advertising in that to allow clients to reach that audience. So if you were a lucky organization like The Economist, you had a neat product that allowed you to make money from selling it to the audience and to make money from selling advertising into it. But then a whole series of um, trends have developed. The first is the thing we've been talking about, the rise of e-reading. The second is the fact that increasingly clients want to um, advertise um, on the web rather than just in print. Thirdly, the fact is that clients actually are saying we don't just want to use advertising anymore, we want to find new ways to engage audiences. And fourthly, the rise of social networks like Facebook and Twitter. And those splodges have made a huge impact, um, apart from a mess on my slide, they've made a huge impact on uh, a publishing business. And what's interesting is if you go back to my thinking about lean back and lean forward, that actually you have an interesting opportunity. You, the, inter the opportunity for lean back 
you can see an iPad advert at the top there. The opportunity for lean back is very similar commercially to the opportunity from print, whereas the opportunity from a lean forward environment is much more um, geared towards making money from um, advertising. Now, it's not quite as straightforward as the print world and things are slightly different position, but that basic model uh, remains correct. So we as a company have to think about how to respond to that. We need to introduce new ways of making money from our marketing clients. It's not enough just to carry advertising. So we need to think about, and I'm sure you hear about in other places, content marketing, other kinds of ways of engaging an audience beyond simply advertising that we can provide for our clients. And we have bought companies that help us to do that. We've developed our own capabilities in those areas. These are just various examples of how we have had to find other ways to, to complement the online advertising world because there isn't enough money to be made in online advertising compared with the money that we used to be able to make in print. But the biggest single thing that we can do to, make, to secure our future is around making sure that we can charge for uh, the products that we sell and charge the audience for the product that we sell and make money from uh, doing that. And the great thing about the publishing business is it's a very, very straightforward business which suits people with simple minds like me. And there are basically four drivers of circulation profit. There's how much you charge, there's the cost of finding new customers, there's how much it costs to distribute your product, and then there's how many of your product you can sell. I'm just going to look at those very briefly. One of the things that's interesting about this lean back world is lots of people will tell you, and I know it's the case in China, that people don't want to pay for online content. But actually, when it comes to content on a tablet, that's not the case. And actually, and I don't have the data for China, and maybe you could, some of you will be able to tell me the answer to this, but actually on a tablet, people are paying for music, people are paying for films, people are paying for magazines, people are paying for books. And what we've managed to do is to turn that to our advantage. And we now say, actually, what you're buying is not the paper, it's not the physical economist, it is what goes into making the economist. So whether you buy it in digital or whether you buy it in print, we should be able to charge you the same amount. And then we say, and if you do want both, because they're a greater cost to us and because we think we're delivering greater value to you, we're going to charge you a premium. So we can actually, through thinking about our pricing, make sure that we maximize the revenue that we make from our business. Secondly, we have the opportunity to drive down the costs of finding new customers. It's one of the biggest hidden costs of a, of a media business, is the cost of acquiring new customers. Actually, one of the great things about um, the social world is that people in the social world put their hands up to say they're interested. So, one of the great difficulties for finding economist readers is how do you find them? How would, you, how would I know where an economist reader is? They're, they are defined more by their psychography, by the way they think, rather than demography about how they, how they, um, uh, what their age is or what their job title is. Whereas, of course, on a website on the Facebook, people are put, millions of people are saying they're becoming fans of The Economist. In Twitter, millions of people are sharing their like of The Economist. Well, if we can target those people, they've already said we're interested in The Economist. That means they're a lot easier to sell to. Distribution. Well, distribution is an area that gets a lot of people in the media industry very hot under the collar and about the, the, uh, uh, how much we have to share with Apple or with Amazon or something else in doing some of our distribution. But actually, if you understand the basic drivers of uh, distribution, then we believe that that is at worst neutral and at best is actually digital offers us significant opportunities because, of course, we're not producing paper products and putting them onto aeroplanes and trains and trucks and shipping them all around the world. And, of course, if you can get the other bits right, then you should, in theory, be able to grow your volume. And this is our estimate of how it's going to be over time. You can see the bottom part of the bar is the print uh, volumes, and you can see print volumes in decline, but you can see that's more than made up by people buying print and digital together. Those are the, that's what we call the premium bundle. And then people who buy digital only, so our overall circulation will grow, and that mix of circulation that you see in those bars is actually highly profitable and much more profitable even without the volume growth compared with what we're seeing today. Now, in advertising, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a different story and perhaps a more difficult story in some ways. There are many challenges with advertising. We talked about some of these just a moment ago. That web advertising does not get the same amount of money as print advertising. 
that tablet advertising remains relatively small, and that in any case, advertising as a share of total marketing spend is in decline. And you can see that represented, the impact that has on newspapers here. That chart on the, uh, uh, what is that, your left, or that chart on the left, the blue line shows you what's happened to American newspaper advertising. And you can see that huge decline. You can see the growth in the orange of total ad marketing for digital, not just to newspapers. And then you can see on the green line at the bottom, that very flat line, what's happened to newspaper digital advertising. So what that says is, yes, newspaper advertising is, dis is disappearing and it's going digital, but it's not going digital to newspapers. That actually, newspapers are losing the net between those two. And it's the American market anyway, the magazine position is somewhat similar. So it's not enough simply to say, I'm losing print advertising, but I'll get it back on the web. You have to find other ways to build um, your digital advertising and marketing strategy. So one way is to make sure that you can charge a lot for your uh, digital advertising, and for us that's very much around the engagement that we get from our Lean Forward strategy of community, of engaging an audience. But it's also recognizing that we can make very good money out of advertising in a digital edition. For those of you who've seen a copy of The Economist on an iPad or any other magazine, you'll know that you have this opportunity to do beautiful full-page advertising that has all the impact of a print ad, but all the interactivity and all the trackability of a web ad. So what that means is, and I think this is critical to those of you also who are looking to build your brands abroad, no longer can you simply say, okay, to where shall I put my ads, as much as that was you know, what I ran a business on. So that would be great if you would all say, you know, where can I put my ad in The Economist? I'd love you all to be saying that. Unfortunately, life is not as simple for you this, uh, anymore that way, and it's not as simple for us. So you have to think about these three overlapping circles. The first is, yes, advertising still has a part to play. You have your messages that you want to put across, and you want to control that message and you want to work out the right media that you put that with. We call that paid media. But the second is earned media. You want to be making sure that you are telling stories that news organizations and other organizations pick up because they are inherently interesting, kind of public relations, PR, that's earned media. And the third is around owned media. That's to say, today many of you will be involved in companies where the websites of those companies themselves have audiences. And what you need is engaging content to put on your own assets to engage an audience. And that combination of earned, paid and owned is the what you as potential clients need to be thinking about and therefore that's what we as media owners need to be thinking about. So we have positioned ourselves to be able to help clients with all three parts of this overlapping um, circles. And what does that mean in terms of, of profitability? Well, what it means is that yes, we will lose some, the, the, the now, we're actually the most profitable we've ever been. This is a relative bridge. So this isn't saying we currently make no profit, we currently make lots of profit, but this is showing you a bridge from now to five years time. It says we will lose some profit because print advertising will be lower. We will lose some profit because print circulation on its own will be a bit lower, but we will make a lot of that back up with these other kinds of digital advertising and other kinds of marketing services, but the biggest single growth in profit that we're going to have is going to come from the profit drivers of digital circulation because we're going to continue, I hope, to engage with you
as our audience and get you, deliver to you value that you will think is worth paying for um, in buying uh, The Economist or whatever else you're reading of that kind. So what do I conclude with? This Lean Back 2.0, this new kind of Lean Back, is only one step. The thing about The Economist, people often say to me, why is The Economist successful when others aren't? And I always say that the thing that makes us successful is that we are very, very lucky. Um, and that luck comes from all sorts of things. But back in 1843, the first article that The Economist ever wrote, um, nearly well, 170 years ago in a couple of months' time, the first article The Economist ever wrote was an article about Brazil. And it wasn't that in 1843 anyone was very interested in Brazil, but that's what we wanted to write about. What's happened is it's not that we have made ourselves relevant, it's the fact that the world has come closer to us. Now, the fact is that for much of the world, writing in English is a good thing. Unfortunately, not in this market, which is something we would. I look forward to you telling me how we should crack uh, going into Chinese in this market. Um, but on the whole, if you're going to pick one language to be in globally, by chance we happen to be in English, and that's worked out um, pretty well for us. Lean Back 2.0, we believe, is another example of our luck. We happen to have a product that works incredibly well in a digital age. Um, we believe that we've had a whole series of lucky breaks. And we hope that uh, with good luck, our uh, success will continue. Thank you very much.